Hello, everybody. It's Grim Grizz. Today I'm meeting for the first time in this fringe encounter, Michael Martin, who I understand to be a musician, poet, and author and prolific father. All of the above. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, um, I know I you I saw you on a couple of shows around the corner. I didn't catch the Viveki one, but I did see you on Vander Clay and with Karen. And um I've uh, seen you on Twitter also. And I, I understand that you uh you share some of my views that aren't the YouTube isn't fond of <laughs> us discussing. That's true. So um as it was, I was in my backyard the other week and I was like, you know, that guy is a biodynamic farmer. And I think he might have some ideas of what I could do with my backyard. And that would be useful to everyone else with a backyard. <laughs> so can you, would you uh, speak briefly on, on what biodynamic farming is first and then? Sure. Well, I've been doing biodynamic farming and gardening for uh, more than 30 years. And it was introduced in 1925 by Rudolf Steiner, who uh, was a, wasn't even, was not a farmer, but people would go to him for insight in different domains, whether it's economics or medicine, education. And he had been bothered by Count Kaiserlink of I think it was then, well, it's now Poland, um, to, uh, to give him some thoughts about agriculture because uh, this was about a generation and a half into industrial ag agriculture with the, the reliance on chemicals and stuff, right? Chemical fertilizers and insecticides. And they had already noticed that a, a significant decline in vitality of plants. So they invited him to come and talk and so he gave some suggestions and indications over the course of a week of lectures, which basically was the beginning of the organic movement. That in, in this country, uh, J.R. Rodale, remember the Rodale gardening magazines, and there was a publishing out there still around. He started around the same time in this country, but Steiner's approach was a little bit more, more esoteric using what you could call homeopathic remedies for, for uh, compost preparations and uh, and as field sprays, but none of it, none of it chemical, all from organic materials. And so, thirty years ago, when I started getting into it, I was taught by a friend of mine who learned from this man named Alan York, who was not that much older than I am, maybe ten years older, and Alan at that time had a farm, I think in California. We called him up on the phone one day and he said, nope, selling my, I'm selling my farm, I'm doing too much consulting. I said, what do you mean consulting? And he said, I keep getting calls about the, from these vineyards. And what was happening is, so 30 years ago, uh, most of the vineyards, not only in this country, but across the world were, were in, in freak out mode because they had been relying on chemical sprays for such a long time that they and that the the vitality of their their vines was horrid horrible and they they really didn't know whether they even had 10 or 15 years left as an industry and so they hired alan york to come and do consulting for them and he he's the you know if you hear about bio, biodynamic wines it's because of him and not only did you know so there are biodynamic wines but there are lots of wineries and vineyards using his methods without being completely biodynamic so he was on to something in fact you can still find uh youtube videos with him and one major vineyard that he did was own, owned by sting from the police and in Italy, I'm pretty sure it was in Italy. And he just kind of rejuvenated all these places. And then unfortunately he died about five years ago, maybe four years ago. Um, but- You were calling him for consulting. Uh, we just called him this, cause he was, he was friends with my friend. So we were, we were gonna get advice about getting land. 
when we called him, what would he recommend for getting land or where? And but he he didn't give us much advice because he was too much <laughs> getting out. He was getting out of the farm and getting into consulting. No, I remember in the uh, piece you did with Karen that you talked about some ritual involving a bullhorn or a cow horn. That's, I wouldn't call it a ritual. It's in fact I got to do it tonight. Um, what you so. There are many, there's a number of preparations I want to get into with them all, but the main ones are called BD 500 and 501. I don't know where the numbers came from, but uh, the 500 is it's cow manure that's put into a cow's horn over the winter months. So usually I'll plant it, you know, I'll bury it in September, late September, and dig it up in April or May. And what happens, it it becomes this, uh, I, I can call it, you can call it homeopathic compost. So it's super potentized compost. And then you take that material, put it into like three or four gallons of water and then stir it, you know, until you make like a, a, like a funnel or a tornado and then reverse direction. You have to do that for, I'd say 45 minutes to an hour. Is this under and, the full moon or anything specific? No. I mean, no, it doesn't have to be on the under the full moon. Okay. Uh, but uh, and that's sprayed on the soil. And then there's another one that's made also in a cow's horn, but it's made from uh, crushed up quartz or or uh, some kind of something in the quartz family. I use feldspar because that's what what's around here, um, and that's buried over the summer months. And that is a full, it uses a foliar spray. A so, foliar spray, what's a foliar spray? Well, it's for the leaves, it's for the oh. leaves and it, okay. and it strengthens the plant. Uh, it's good since it's got so much silica in it, it strengthens the plant and, and its ability to stand up straight, but also it can help prevent mold and, and those kinds of things. So it, the whole idea is just to create um, a healthy, environment and, and, the, and the ideal in a biodynamic farm is to have zero you know the input equals output so you don't um import anything into the farm you know and so so for instance whether it's feeds or manure so manure is a good one right the ideal is that you would never go someplace else or buy some, you know, get, get a truckload of manure. You just have your own created and you create a kind of ecosystem on your own farm. Now it's not possible for, for everybody. In fact, it's, it's hard to do that 100% for anybody. So for instance, at our farm, we're only 10 acres. We don't have enough room to grow grains or hay so when I grow, you know, when I use hay in the winter for my, for my cattle, mm -hmm. sheep, I have to get that from somebody local. I'll get it from local. Local is good, but, but over the summer, they, they, they just graze on our pasture. We have a couple of small pastures and I kind of, I move them back and forth between them. Um, but ideally, if you had the space, you wouldn't do that. Now, and, and it's the thing is, if you're going to do it like that, it's a lot of work for one family, right? So what happens in some places in, I know, Wisconsin and New York and Pennsylvania, they have collectives of farms that they kind of cooperate. So maybe the one farmer does, does cattle and pasture where the other guy does, does grain, right? So it's so, like a biodynamic community. It is, and it becomes a community. Yeah. Yeah. So, so those are helpful things. But the idea is that I mean, you're not only doing this to create, you know, to come up with nutritious food, but you're also in a in a way healing the earth, right? You're 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 restoring fertility to the earth. That's good. The land. It's a balance, as yeah. as you mentioned. Um, yeah. Okay, so like I, I'm about as far from ideal as possible, like being in town, but with a backyard. But in that situation, what's 
like I don't even know what foods I should be planting. Like I threw some onions and potatoes in in the ground to see what would happen. But mm -hmm. but given the the rising prices of food and everything Maybe. that's apparently bearing down on us, despite the fact that it's probably way too late, what would you recommend someone to start with as far as crops and when to do them? Um, well, it depends on where you live, like you said. Um, the main thing is, uh, no, when I started, I started, we, we were in the city when we started, we had, there's a picture uh, on our farm's website <laughs> of, of, of me and my wife in our backyard with my, I think my son's with us. And uh, it was a little tiny backyard in a, in a property we were renting in Ferndale, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. Um, and we grew quite a bit out there, but the, the, the challenge in city gardens isn't the growing um, or finding what to grow, it's getting enough sun. Because a lot of places in city gardens, they have trees all over the, over the yard. So you're limited as to how, how much sun you can get. Now, mm. now, if you do, I mean, and because you definitely need sun. It doesn't have to be all day, but you need a decent amount of sun, six, seven hours of sun, right? Yeah, I got, um, I got three quarters of a yard that have, that apply and that uh, need to be mowed regularly. And like, I throw the grass clippings and stuff in the dirt to hope that helps as far as like, help. providing help. nutrients. So, so that's one thing. So you got to make sure you have enough sun. And the idea in biodynamic gardening and farming is that it all starts in the soil. So you have to try to regenerate the soil through making compost. Yeah. Now, when I, we were in the city, you know, what I would do, I would, I had a compost pile I would make and, but you need some, you know, some rich source of nitrogen for compost. We're, we're, we're lucky we have cows um, or in what else, we have cows and chickens and other kinds of fowl. We also have a couple lambs. So that they all contribute to the compost. And we also use, you know, kitchen scraps, grass yeah, Kitchen scraps and coffee, like coffee grounds, kitchen scraps and grass clippings I have. Yeah. Um, I could get some nitrogen, like probably from a, where Amazon, <laughs> but. You know, I would do, I, but here's what I used to do. I would go, I had a pickup truck or and you, and I, people have done it without pickup trucks, you know, get like, big bins or something and you can go to a riding stable and they'll ha they're happy to, to load your truck up with that stuff because they want to they don't know what to do with it anymore right so they they're happy and you get it for free so i would i would bring that stuff home and incorporate it into my compost pile in fact um i guess horse manure is, is really hot i would do that i would incorporate that directly into the soil but in the fall, so it gave time to break down a little bit. So by the time I was ready to plant in the spring, it was it was making the soil pretty rich. So so all kinds of things you can do. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Findhorn. You ever hear of Findhorn? No, no. Findhorn is this community in Scotland that started in the 60s, probably the 65 or so. And you know, the, the story goes that nature spirits started to speak to these pretty just normal middle class people about do, starting this garden in really horrible soil. And, I, and I'd always heard about this and, you know, and I even had met people who had been there, but I never investigated it too much until this past winter, I was at a used bookstore nearby and they had this, you know, like, the dollar table, you know, mm. oh, yeah. and on the dollar table, they had the Findhorn book. So I said, oh, it's a buck. I'll take that home. And I'm looking at it and people were acting as the, if, if, at Findhorn, they were just miraculous. They're getting these giant cabbages all just by talking to nature spirits. But that's not the whole story. The, the whole story is the guy who was in, in charge of their garden was going around in, in the place where they were in Scotland and collecting seaweed or you know manure or all kinds of organic material to build up the soil so maybe they were talking to nature spirits but they were practicing some some decent organic 
compost methods as well you know yeah so 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 that's 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 super important when you're starting out is to to develop the soil in that way and then you know slow and slow and steady wins the race so now it's probably a little hotter where you are than where i am even though right now it's about to get hot here in michigan um 100 today actually <laughs> wow it's going to be 95 in a few days here i saw but so and probably in oklahoma you can start a lot earlier than we can we can't really start planting outside until april <clears throat> um so if you if there are early things you can plant that are easy so and early meaning they like cool weather mm -hmm. and those are things like peas arugula is really easy to grow radishes are really easy to grow um carrots um carrots are, are challenging it's like take, they take so long to germinate so you you, you got to be on top of it before the, before the weeds take over um a lot of things that are really lettuce is pretty easy to grow um what we do and we've been doing this for a while so we'll start and in fact it wasn't until a few years ago that we had a greenhouse i finally found a greenhouse kit and built a greenhouse and we would uh even before that though we would start in the house we'd start tomatoes and peppers and eggplant in just pots wow. and and the thing the the danger is with that is if you don't have a decent amount of of uh of light coming through the window they start to stretch out and get rangy and they eventually <laughs> collapse because they're not getting enough light and they're stretching out to try to get some so they get they get a bit rangy which is why we got the greenhouse but even if you just started with plants from like a nursery or something that you know they're all people are always selling tomato plants and, and other things you know so you can do that as well you know um so there are there's a million different ways to go about it and uh but i would say the main thing for people who are are, are want to start out is build the soil and take it take it slow until you know until, until you get you know, get your bearings <clears throat> um well, what would you say like the most uh like since you're doing it for your first time you want you want the, a, a crop that's uh it's gonna make you feel good what's a, what's a feel good starter crop like the tomatoes maybe or tomatoes always uh tomatoes are, are a good feel a feel good crop arugula is because you get it so quickly arugula is ready in about three or four weeks oh okay the same with radishes um so th so that you feel like you're doing something tomatoes yeah. you gotta wait three months right <laughs> tomatoes yeah. gotta, the payoff comes a little later with tomatoes um yep yeah, those that's what's nice about those short season things is uh is you get immediate results almost almost immediate results if you need the um, encouragement is the thing another thing so another thing um big challenge for people in the city is and even here i was just doing this yesterday is um dealing with sod a lot of times people have to dig sod out or dig grass out mm -hmm. in order to start a garden now how do you do that right um oh. So far, I've been like turning it over, assuming that when it died and decayed, you know, I just okay, I stir it up, it's going to be dirt now. And it, that does work, but it depends on how long, it, far ahead of time you do that. Because if you do it right before you plant, um, so what's the better way? <laughs> well, there's several ways. So, what we do, we, we do what's called no till farming or gardening and which is uh so here's the ideal right so if i know i'm going to do no-till in a section of a garden um but i want to kill the grass that there is there first and i don't want to flip it over because some grasses uh especially like couch grass if you cut the roots it just it's like the hydra it just grows more heads and all of a sudden it's all over the place 
and this is what I was dealing with yesterday because we had to extend our one garden, <laughs> so a few more beds. <laughs> like I was dealing with this stuff that was so knotty and thick, it was insane. Um, but if I knew ahead of time though, that I was gonna need to do this, what we do is we'll get cardboard, um, hopefully that doesn't have um, like the glossy and it'll put like a cover on with glossy images and stuff. Don't yeah. use that, use the regular brown cardboard, not waxed cardboard. Mm -hmm. And you put it down like where you're gonna have this garden in the next year. So if, if I were planning this ahead, so say I was gonna do a garden in the spring, in the fall, and I've done this many times, I'll throw down, say, a 10 by 20 foot section of soil of ground, cover it with, with uh, this cardboard. And on top of that, I would probably, you know, you can put whatever, but I wouldn't put dirt, but I would, you could put straw or leaves or something that when it gets wet, it gets a little weight to it. It'll hold the cardboard in place. And that will, will kill the grass. And then when you come to it in, in, the, in the spring, then you can, what we do, you might want to rototill it. You might just want to, um, so rototilling is, is a decent way to start, but I would never do it every year. Some people rototill every single year, which is mm. not actually a good thing to do. Because um, they say with rototilling or plowing, you know, you plow for one year, you got weeds for three. So if you do no-till, <clears throat> you know, you don't have as many weeds, which is nice. So you have a lot more time. So, so you got the cardboard, got the straw there, stays there for over winter. Then you take it off in the spring. Um, then you can form beds. Now, there's a really good book about planting guide, you know, really simple, also great advice about the size of beds. It's called The Market Gardener by Jean-Martin Fortier, I think his last name is. He's from Montreal, I believe. And he's got really good advice about size of beds. So we, we follow his advice about the width of beds, about 30 inch beds. That way you can reach to the other side from one side. Um, very, very practical. So we have 30 inch beds and about 15 inch paths between them. And we also, and I think he does too, we use a method called, uh, now it's called bio-intensive, it used to be called French intensive, where you plant in such a way that the plants you want will, will overshadow the weeds. So for instance, uh, lettuce, which I just planted some lettuce yesterday. So in a 30 inch bed, we'll have three rows that are about 10 inches apart. And you put the, the lettuce is they're 12, they're 12, they're spaced 12 inches apart in a row. So okay. you got three rows in a bed. And what happens, the lettuce gets, starts to grow. At first you have to hoe or weed a little bit, but what's gonna happen is the lettuce will get nice and big and the, the the outside leaves of each lettuce will touch the outside leaves of the other one. So you got no space for weeds. Uh -huh. And this is a method that was developed in France, I think in the 1800s, which is a really uh, practical and economical way to do things, especially because, you know, if you're thinking you're in a city garden, you don't have that much space. So how can you, how can you get as much as possible out of the space you're using? And, and, that intensive method is, is the way to go for sure. Okay. So like in that situation, would there not be a point in the year where I find myself with say 15 heads of lettuce and is it like harvest time? And then like most of my lettuce goes to waste because I can't eat it that fast. Or do you bring it in like as you go or. Um, well, lettuce, lettuce, it, it's there are different ways to go that like a head lettuce, for instance, or a romaine type of lettuce. Yeah, Those okay. are not the main head, but there are some like oak leaf, and that's probably a good one. Oak leaf is a good example where you can do what's called cut and come again. So you just go out and take, you know, say you have 10 or 15 of these lettuce, and you might have the green oak leaf and the red oak leaf and something this spotted one. 
And you can go out there and say you have 10 of them. You can take a few leaves off each one and they'll grow back. So you, and so you have uh, a way to uh, keep coming back to it. Now, eventually the lettuce is going to bolt, you know, because it does not live that long. It only lives, if, you, if you can do that for two months, you're lucky, right? But that's why people do a succession planting. So for us, for instance, we did our first sowing of lettuce uh, beginning of April, middle of April, and we'll do another. We did another one three weeks later. So th there's kind of a succession going in. Now, where you are in Oklahoma, the danger is like, for lettuce. Lettuce doesn't like very hot. Yeah, that right? might not so be. It stops growing when it gets hot. So some people will shade it. They'll put a like a you can buy covers or uh, like tunnels that will shade it which is useful. Uh, but the other hand, uh, there are other things you can use instead of lettuce, which are still leafy vegetables, which can handle drought and a little heat, like kale, for instance. Mm. Kale is a little tougher than lettuce. doesn't bolt. So, but, so the important bit is like trying to get stuff that's leafy enough to shade out the potential weeds that would otherwise grow. Yeah, I mean, and, and so we, we plant kale in this, the same organization as we do. I think it's a little, um, you know, it's, this, it's the same dimensions as we do with, with lettuce. And so, and we do the end radishes, we'll do four or five rows of radishes, and they also cover the whole thing. So it's, so it doesn't give the weeds a chance to get through. So what, what one would need to know is about, about whatever crop, especially if you're going to try the succession planting thing, is how long it takes to grow, when it will be ready, and when to stop putting them in the ground. And, well, that's what, yeah. And, and that's what, uh, like that book I mentioned, any good gardening book, there's also one called The Gardener's Bible. I can't remember the name of the guy. Um, they'll all give you what with how long to maturity like lettuce is 50 days for instance or uh spinach is also 50 days 45 days so they'll give you a, they'll give you spacing guides and they'll give you um how long to plan on this being here you know when, when it's going to be too big and you can and you start to get the hang of it i mean you know you probably the first first year or two that you try you, you know Part, part of it is trial and error. Even for us, still, we've been doing it for 30 years. You know, for instance, this is the first year we've been, that we've grown some, some regular kinds of celery. Celery is really hard to grow. Celery is tough. We've done Chinese celery, which is a little easier, but celery is tough. Um, well, what about celery? What, what do you mean by tough? It's hard to grow um, you, because when, you're, when you plant the seeds, it's got to be, um, warm and they're, they're very delicate so it's got to be warm but it's you get to plant them early enough to get them in the ground when it's not right mm -hmm. so then you have to so we do those in the greenhouse but and we have a heating pad under them which other things are not that fussy you know so and people have bad luck with celery and celery is really picky about compost and about richness of the soil so it's it's a challenge it's a challenge whereas lettuce is super easy kale is easy so you're Most looking for easy. easy or robust in the plant descriptions when you're deciding what to do when you're starting out is it easy and robust let's say that again in in the descriptions of when you're deciding what to put out like those would be good keywords to search for Easy, well, I, I mentioned the easy ones, but robust. Um, well, robust depends upon the, upon the time of year, right? Okay. Now, in cool weather, it's not worth trying to plant tomatoes outside. But it's great for lettuce, great for peas. Mm. Um, great for arugula. I would never, you don't want, so we're, it's going to get really hot here, so we won't be planting arugula again until September. So, but on the other hand, 
the tomatoes are going to be really happy with all that heat because they like the heat. So, so do peppers, so do that plant. Um, so what do you like when you're done with planting arugula? So like in the last place you planted it, when it comes in, are you are you going to leave that fallow or until no. you plant again? Or are you going to put something in <clears throat> where it was? So we actually we just finished, our arugula just finished this last week. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to what we'll do is we'll pull it out the because the, what we do, we cut it. We don't pull it out, but we'll cut, we'll pull out the roots. Um, and we'll maybe throw some compost down. And then in that row, I think we're going to follow it up with Swiss chard, mm -hmm. which likes likes the heat more than arugula does. And so, and and and, but but if you you know if you're doing a home garden, you don't have to get as uptight about that as uh, as as a market garden like we are doing. Um, because you're not trying to produce things for people look outside of yourself. So we right. we, were, we have 30 families in our CSA. So we have to kind of plan it out, make sure everybody gets some everybody gets something every week. But if you're doing it for yourself, if you don't have the kind of pressure or for, for your own family. Um, um, another good thing, um, with the thing, something to think about. So another 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 easy crop is that summer squash is very easy. And, it, uh, but you have to allow for space. They don't get that big, but they get about four feet in diameter, each Ooh. one. I mean, not the, not the squash, but the plant does, right? It's a three, four feet. Wow. So you have to have the proper space. Now, if you want to grow winter squash, um, some market gardeners won't grow winter squash because it, it you need a whole field and it goes crazy. It's, it's, it's a jump becomes a jungle. So in fact, this year we lost part of our, our garden to uh to flooding because we it's been crazy since the last fall, the amount of water we've had. So we had to we had to give up this one section to we'll let the cows graze there. So we could we couldn't plant winter squash there. So we had to we uh went over to my brother-in-law's house a few miles away and, and took part of his his pasture to plant winter squash because you know we're out of space um because it does take up a lot of room but it's a great thing to grow because what, what, what's cool about winter squash is it keeps and you can keep it all winter so you can you know you can have squash until spring easily so it's not because you plant it in the winter it's because it lasts through the winter they call it that that's what they call it yeah um like acorn squash right is a, is a good example right so you said csa what is that csa means Com community supported agriculture which is what we do here and what that means is people buy a share in the farm for the season so um so so they get a share and then every week they'll they'll pick up They'll come to the farm and pick up their vegetables, and we have a we have a box for them. Usually has about seven or eight different things in it. That's yeah. awesome, actually. I'm glad yeah. such a thing exists. And and so on ten acres, you're doing thirty people or thirty families. Well, our garden is only about an acre. So Maybe not even quite an acre. One acre. How big is the backyard compared to an acre? It's like, um, but, well, it depends. Most backyards are, um like an eighth of an acre or a quarter of an acre you can but you can when we were in the city we uh one time we we had a house in the city on a double lot and it was a beautiful yard and the garden was not huge it might have been 20 by 50 but we had all kinds of, i mean we we grew we had all kinds of produce out of that that lasted us, for, you know. But we, essentially, we fed ourselves ourselves vegetables from June through October, at least. Right. So you can do it. Um. All right. I got. I got to. I got to uh, try and jump on the uh, on the news train for the algorithm. <laughs> okay. 
And and I noticed that your tweet today said that this this lambda thing was not sophiology. So I wanted to ask you about that. About lambda? Yeah, I don't know why you said not sophiology in well, relation. Well, sophiology to now. Um, in addition to being a farmer, I'm a professor early. And I ha I've written books on sophiology and sophiology. Sophia in exile. Pick it up. Sophia in exile is the last one, but the first one was uh, the submerged reality. And that was followed up with transfiguration. And Sophia in, ex Sophia in exile is the third in that trilogy, which was, was not an intended tri trilogy, just how it worked out. Um, but sophiology is the I in a nutshell, the idea of living in harmony or communication with both the natural and the spiritual worlds or the, mm -hmm. the nature and divinity. So you have this kind of, it's, it's a very holistic picture. And that's why the Lambda thing is the opposite of that, right? It's, 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 it's the technocracy, it's the God of the technocrats, <laughs> right? Maybe, but I got the impression from the discussions you had that I watched that like Sophia is is when the beauty and or the grace shines through. Right. And I I'm not opposed to the idea of that of the beauty and the grace shining through in man's creation in ways they don't expect or understand. Yeah, I don't know. I agree with that. I mean, that's why I think one place people uh, perceive Sophia or the glory of the Lord is through art, right? Mm -hmm. It's through art and poetry. I'm, I'm not sure that a self-generated AI is the same thing. Just too far divorced from nature to qualify. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, I didn't mean to. Plus, like, you, know, you know, I mean, and, it, and it's an interesting thing I mean, with with technology. So we're we're obviously using technology right now, which a lot, which gives me the chance to, to almost we're in communion with it at least. Yeah. Right? Um, but on the other hand, the, I mean, but we, but you, I think we both know that it, it, this is a different experience than if we were in the same room. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, but it's easy for us to, to take like a, a, the second generation reel as the reel, you know, mm. I used to do an experiment when I was a, I was a teacher, when I was a professor on, it was an example of phenomenology. And so I happened to have a piano in the classroom, which is why I thought to do this. And we were doing something, I can't remember what we were talking about, but I said, all right, check it out. And so I, on the screen at the front of the classroom, I put on the Beatles playing Hey Jude. I said, no, listen. So I gave, let them listen to the first minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was a nice sound system. It wasn't like it was a crummy sound system, but we had the piano there. And I sat down at the piano and I'm not a really great piano player and I'm not a really great singer, but I played the piano and I sang. And I said to the students, I say, what's the difference? And it's never not happened where they, where they say, I don't know what it is, Professor Martin, but when you do it, I like it even, even though you can't sing as well as Paul McCartney, I like it better. Well, I said, well, why is that? And, and, and the thing is, I mean, I listen to the Beatles all the time, right? <laughs> so I enjoy listening to the Beatles, mm -hmm. but we forget that those are not authentic experiences of a, of a human voice in a musical instrument. You know, those are not, those are, that's what they call them recordings, right? You ever have that experience where people want to show you pictures from their vacation? And you can't- a while, thankfully, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we've been there, right? And you can't, and because they like the pictures because it reminds them of something they saw, mm -hmm. of a place they were. But those of us who weren't there can't relate to it in the same way. But, but so much of our experience of music, using that as an example, 
is through synthetic means, the people don't take that to be the primary ex experience of music, which it's, it's not, but it, and it's amazing how few people, fewer and fewer have just the normal experience of music. Right, how, how rare the actual presence of music being made at least. Yeah, and I was thinking about, you know, a lot of my friends are musicians, as you can imagine. And my one friend, Billy, he's really a great singer, great songwriter, knows every song ever written, I think. And he'll play at like these farmers markets or other kinds of such restaurants or something. And he's there and he's playing his ass off. And so, you know, but but it's he's he's doing it through a microphone into a PA system, which you know it's not really loud. Everybody's talking, no one's paying attention. You, know, you think about that, and then you think about back in the early 60s when Dylan and Joni Mitchell would play at the bottom line in New York, and there was no amplification, no microphones, and people were silent and paying attention. It's amazing how much um, how much we've lost. That used to be an experience that young people desired of hearing that, right? But where did it go? Where did it go? Or like, if not like just being there, um, was a, was a you got to be part of a thing by being being there, and that's that's part of what we've lost. I've I like to re re think of it as like nobody, no scientist ever sat a monkey in front of a screen for 40 years to see what happened. <laughs> yeah. And that we've lost a lot of stuff and that maybe by by starting to grow things in our backyards and, and that sort of thing, we can get back some of what it means, the good in life. Yeah. That, uh, that we're no, losing touch that's, with. That's exactly the truth as far as I'm concerned. You know, and that's I, that's what, you know, my wife and I, so 30 years ago, we started getting into this stuff, right? And, and that's why we wanted to, you know, not only for ourselves, but for our, for our children to provide, you know, to have an experience of something that's real and means something, right? And growing your own food, I mean, it certainly does. I mean, you know, now and then, of course, we start off growing our own food. Then, then we br branched out to raising animals, and now we raise we raise cows. And it, and it's amazing for me. I, mean, I was just having these realizations. My relation my relationships with these animals on my farm is kind of amazing. You know, I, I kind of know them. I know their personalities of each animal. And we have, so we have three cows right now, or, or one steer and two cows and uh, two sheep, and geese and ducks and chickens. But, and, and we, I raise bees. And each one has its own individuality, you know, and they all, then they respond to you in different ways from each other. And, you know, it's really an interesting thing. And, you know, you think about, um, how we in Western civilization, that used to be a very common experience for most people until industrialization, right? I mean, that was, you wouldn't have to explain that. <laughs> you know, what, that, that's, a, that's a normal way to, to proceed through life. I'd like, to, I'd like to make that as an invitation to anybody who sees this to consider, like, how much suffering goes into the food they're eating under these industrialized systems. Yeah, and absolutely. I've always took that you are what you eat thing a little, maybe too seriously, but. No, I think, I think it's true. And um, you got another book coming? Um, I'm working on a book of poetry right now, kind of slowly. And I have another book in mind that I started reading 
researching on, uh, which I hope to be called The Land. That's the, my working title. Mm -hmm. and, and about our relationship to nature and the land. Oh. That's, that's what I'm working towards. Well, I won't take any more of your time. Um, if you have anything you'd like to say on the way out. Uh, hey, this is a lot of fun. Just, we're, Pleasure we're to have met you. Finally. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Hey, thank you. Good.